Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. I'm Julie, your host, and I'm so delighted you could join us. My intention in doing this show is to provide information, insight, and comfort to people all around the world by helping to answer life's unanswerable questions. And I have a Julie here with me this week. (laughs) This is like Julie... Julie do Julie square Julie That's I don't right. know Julie McFadden it. welcome welcome thank you Julie Ryan happy to be here I you love your name I love I your name same, same we've been trying to do this you guys for a long time I don't know probably a year I think yes yes we have thank you for keeping with it yeah absolutely and then I sent her another note and I said ah oh, has your schedule opened up a little bit and she said yeah, let's do it. And I said, woohoo. So yeah, there we go. Yeah. yeah. I have questions for you, my girl. I can't I've wait. on these. Yeah. I can't so, wait. Everybody, let me tell you about Julie. Julie McFadden, BSN RN, has been a nurse for more than 15 years with experience in ICU and now hospice slash palliative care. She's been featured in Newsweek, USA Today, The Atlantic, People, and several other worldwide publications. She's been passionate about normalizing death through education to the masses using social media. Her TikTok account has more than a million followers, and you can find her on all social media platforms at Hospice Nurse Julie. I share a lot of her stuff, especially on Instagram, Julie. I share your stuff, your reels, especially when you um, there. I've shared them a lot. So you guys are all going to be familiar with her stuff. If if you watch my channel, you're going to see it. So is it common for your hospice patients to see their deceased loved ones as they're approaching the end of their lives? Girl, you know it. (laughs) I remember when I first started my TikTok channel, there was like five topics I wanted to make sure I covered. And I had no idea people were going to actually listen, right? You hope, but you don't really know. And the main thing I wanted people to know, because I thought it was so fascinating as a nurse, that this is a real thing. This is a real symptom or sign of death and dying, people seeing dead relatives. And it really, as a nurse who who uh, is trying to help families navigate, you know, when this is going to happen, how close is someone to death, it, it's a real thing about, you know, usually about three to four weeks prior to death. A lot of people will start seeing dead relatives, loved ones, pets, friends. It doesn't have to be family, right? Just anyone you love. It's usually very comforting. It's a sign. It's an actual sign of death and dying. So yes, people, it's a it's a thing. It's a real, it's a real thing. And everybody until recently, I think, thought, oh, grandma's just hallucinating. Or yeah. it's the morphine or mm-hmm. something like that. But the actual research, there's university-based research that shows Uh that 90% of people at the end of their lives see deceased loved ones and the spirits of deceased pets, either in visions or dreams. And their research shows, Julie, that that can be up to six months before they die. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 There's, it's, it's really interesting. There's a, a hospice director named Chris Kerr, who's an MD, PhD, who did this research. I've had him on the show. And I love it when science catches up with woo-woo because yeah. people have been seeing this for forever. And yeah. he 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 has a book called Death is But a Dream that talks about this. And I'm an inventor of surgical devices sold throughout the world and a former manufacturer. I've done university-based research at big academic medical centers, more than one. It's hard Mm -hmm. to get that research done at those places. And his research is very conclusive. 90%. That's a big number. That's what I was going to say. I think a lot of people think that, including other healthcare workers, that we're that we are saying this to just say it or or to like comfort people or to not give scientific backing to it. And, and, and uh, before I was a hospice nurse, I might have thought the same thing, like, oh, well, maybe it's because they, because ha- what happens is those videos ultimately always go viral. So whenever something goes viral, there's always love and there's always hate if it's, if it's a viral video. And the people who want to discredit it want to say, oh, it's because of lack of oxygen. It's because they're delusional. It's because of hallucinations. It's because 
of um, medication, you know, they always want to give reasons. And if I or anyone else studying this could give a reason, we would. The whole point is, as a healthcare professional who knows what delirium is, who knows what ICU psychosis is, who knows what happens when someone is having a medication reaction, uh, this is, or who has low oxygen and is and is confused or disoriented. Visions are very different than that. That's the, that's that's what it, I mean. Just point blank, visions are different than that. These people are not usually even on oxygen. They're not having episodes of confusion. Usually, they're usually alert and oriented and having true visions. We'd call it right. It's it's we know what we know what the other things are. I know what ICU delirium looks like. Visioning is much different than ICU delirium, right? So. It's just a distinct difference, and it happens at the end of life for, like you said, 90% of people. Well, and and Dr. Kerr says that a, another big difference between delirium and visioning, as you call it, is it's comforting. Mm-hmm. Delirium's right. upsetting. It Clearing. agitates the exactly. person who's dying. Yes. But, but visioning is comforting. They're, they're, he talks in his book about he's got a patient whose mom died when the patient was five and the patient's like 90 something now. And he's not only seeing his mom, he's smelling her perfume. And he hadn't done that since he was a little boy. And that was so comforting to him. That's what I talk about in my book, Angelic Attendance. What happens as we transition from this life into the next, although I'm on it from the spiritual side. So I can describe what their loved ones look like to the other family members in the room. I can see all the deceased loved ones spirits in my mind's eye that are Mm -hmm. there. I can see what pets are there. I'll say, did your grandmother grow up on a farm? And they'll say, yeah, how did you know? And I'll say, well, because there's farm animal spirits in the room. There's like cows and goats and chicks and pigs and stuff like that. And I'll describe what dogs and cats look like. I had a client recently whose mom was dying. And I said, "Uh, this is random, but your mom has a goat spirit in the room. And they said, yeah, she had a pet goat growing up. And they told me what its name was and all of that. And the other thing that I see, Julie, is I see a um, sequence of events that I call the 12 phases of transition. As somebody is getting closer and closer to death, the angels that surround them and the deceased spirits and deceased pets, the configuration of them changes, goes in a circle around them first, opens up into a horseshoe and then a straight line across the foot oh. of the bed. So I can tell in a New York second, I can scan anybody anywhere in the world. And so do all my graduates of my classes. We can tell how close to death somebody is. We can communicate with the patient telepathically. I have endless stories about, you know, grandma needs this. Your mom wants that. Here's where the safety deposit box is. It's at the corner of these streets. The stories are endless. So it validates from the spiritual side what you're witnessing from the patient side and vice versa. So I believe we're like, I'm like the yin to your yang yeah, with yeah, this yeah. as this goes to be together. So seeing spirits at the end of life is found in most religious texts, the humanities, and as far back as ancient Greece. Some examples include the Bible, Plato's Republic, Shakespeare's King Lear, and Renaissance paintings. Perhaps the most well-known in our Western society is Charles Dickens' The Christmas Carol, you know, the ghost of Christmas, past, present, (laughs) and and future. So do you think people have been able to see their deceased loved ones as they were dying since the beginning of time? Um, You know, I think so. I think I, yes. So what's funny is I have a video about someone who sent uh, sent me, they sent me in this family heirloom they found of someone who was dying in 1980, or I'm sorry, 1899. So it's not even that long ago, but long enough ago, where um, basically this person talks about visioning. They had a full vision and they happened to be able to describe it and wrote it down and had a, a real change of heart. Uh, at the very, very end of their life. So that's just one example, one really cool example I thought that was caught in writing of this person having this, um, you know, spiritual awakening and event at the very end of their life. 
But I think in general, yes. I mean, the our I think it's a biological resp- response to dying. Not only I know we're talking about, for lack of better words, like the woo-woo spiritual side of it, but really I think it's an actual biological response to dying uh, as well, which I think is amazing and fascinating. So if it's happening to us now, it was happening to us for eons as we were dying. As cavemen. Cave yeah, women. That's because we've yeah. all been dying <laughs> for for as long as we've been here, right? So yeah, I think I that's a think. that's a really interesting point that I've never heard before. That it's part of the biological process of dying, and is it a way to help us relax and yeah. ease into dying, perhaps, as as we're right. getting closer? Right. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you. Yeah, I mean, of course, I don't know why it's happening, but I, but it, but it's happening, right? And. What I think is so fascinating from like the the science or the biological standpoint from like a nursing perspective is, is that um, I don't know why it happens. I just know it does so much so that we actually, you know, this isn't, we actually educate our fa- our families about this. You know, I give them a pamphlet that says, you know, around four weeks before death ish, your loved one might start seeing dead relatives, dead loved ones. It's okay. As long as they're comforted, go with it. It's okay. You know, I mean, I think that's such a fascinating thing that uh, from a from a healthcare provider perspective that we actually educate about it. So families understand it's normal and to be expected. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the stories are endless that I can share with you from people from all over the world. And the thing that amazes the families so much is that it it really comforts them and it brings them joy. And I find that so many people are afraid to die. Mm-hmm. There's lots of information about the afterlife. There's lots of information about near-death experiences, but there's not much information about what happens as somebody's really dying. And people have been so inundated with, well, you better be good. So you go to heaven or if you're not good, you know, so people are wondering, am I going to fly or am I going to fry when I die? Mm-hmm. And so there's an exercise that I do too, and my graduates do, that's called the walk to heaven. And it's kind of like a dress rehearsal where we'll help the person's spirit and we'll show them what's going to happen on the spiritual side. And when they get to the pearly gates, all their loved ones are there waiting for them. And they're, okay, well, this isn't anything to be afraid of. And they usually go pretty quickly after that time. Mm. and. We can communicate with them telepathically, even if they're not able to communicate verbally anymore or even write. And so many of them, Julie, will say, I'm just afraid. I I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to purgatory. Do you find that with some of your patients that they're afraid to die, the patients themselves? So I would say most people are afraid to die. I wouldn't necessarily say only because I'm not talking to them on a, on a spiritual level, right? I'm not talking right. about heaven or hell with them. Uh, right. I'm talking just the, just the act of dying. I think people are afraid of because it's unknown. You know, I always say I'm not afraid to die and I'm not. However, I am still human. And if I got diagnosed with a ter- terminal illness tomorrow, I still have all the human emotions around it. Sadness, anger, fear in and out of that, you know, Um So I think it's normal to like fear the unknown. Um, And many, I'd say many and most of my patients start out afraid. Um, And what I always say to them is that like, the fact that you can even say you're afraid, even say those words, because I think we deny, deny, deny. We don't want to admit that. Because if we admit it, that's even more scary. Or we so we think. So I think my patients that are even willing to say, I'm afraid to die. Or like, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. Or is there really a God? Even people who, you know, they'll say, I had a lady once say like, I've been a Christian all my life, but am I really going to close my eyes and wake up and see God? You know, so that even people who believe all their life still have questions. And I think people who are even, I'm not even sure if I'm answering your question. I'm sorry, Julie, but I just think people who are willing to even have those discussions are already so far ahead of a lot of people. And Mm -hmm. I think that's why even started this page is to kind of get this conversation going because it's not, it's, it's normal to fear. And just because we fear doesn't mean we can't talk about it. And, um, I think the more you do, the less you will fear. 
And the more you can kind of figure out where that fear is coming from. And is it a, is it a spiritual thing? Are you afraid of what's next and where you're going? And if so, what does that even mean and why, and how can you work through it? Um, and I think the biggest thing for me, from what I see with, with dying people is that the more willing you are to even discuss it, even if you don't come to a conclusion, the just the better off you are as far as decreasing that fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I find too that with people who are elderly, I think of my Mima for whom I'm named. Yes. He died six weeks shy of her hundredth birthday. And she told me for, oh gosh, probably 10 years before she died. And I've had several other elderly people who were loved ones say to me, I'm just ready to go. I've lived my life that, you know, and we say, but aren't you going to miss us? Yeah, I'm going to miss you, but I've lived my life. Now it's time for you to live yours. And I'm just tired. I don't really want to be here anymore. And I think that is so comforting to hear. And we normally hear that from people, at least in my experience, certainly I'd love to hear your input on this, but I hear it from elderly people primarily. Sometimes I'll hear it from people who've suffered with some kind of cancer or disease and they'll say, I'm just tired. I just don't want to do this anymore. I'm ready to go. What an amazing place to be for a launch pad Uh to go into whatever comes next. Nobody knows for sure what comes next, but for me, I think it's going to be interesting to find out. I'm not ready to go anytime soon, but I think it's going to be interesting to see all the things that we hear. Are some of them feasible? Certainly. But have you experienced, I know you've experienced that probably countless times. And and what is it that you have found that those people that are ready to go, where are they at that point? Just from a life standpoint, forget about spirituality. I think you said it perfect. I mean, I see it a lot in the my, all of my grandparents who are all dead, uh, all of them ready to go, but they were in their nineties, you know, but uh, mm-hmm. they, in their nineties, and my, my, I remember my grandma was like irritated on her 91st birthday. She was like annoyed that she was still around celebrating this birthday. She's like, if people would give her gifts. She'd be like, I don't need it. You guys keep it. Like she doesn't want the candle set. She was like done. So I see it a lot in elderly people. Uh, who are just sort of like, I'm good, you know, I've been here for X amount of years and I'm I'm okay. Um, and I think you said it right too. And people who are who who've suffered a lot, who've had long-standing chronic terminal eventually illnesses, right? Who've just been dealing with it for so long that they do get to a point where they're where they're um where they're just ready. They're just ready. And um and for those who aren't You know, that's, you have to meet people where they're at. That's what I always say. You have to meet people where they're at, like whatever, wherever they are, if they're ready, if they're not, I do think people die how they lived for the most part. I mean, everyone can, every people can change, but like, if you were kind of like crotchety and irritable throughout your life or unwilling to explore, uh, explore, um, existential thing, you know, like existential thinking throughout your life, you're not going to necessarily die, you're going to die the way you lived. If you were quiet and not talking about how you felt, you're not going to suddenly talk about the meaning of life at the end of your life. You know, I mean, every once in a while people change and like they do surprise you, but for the most part, people die how they live. So if you're like, if you're um, not willing to discuss the meaning of life while you're living, you might not be when you're dying either. And I think that can affect how you die. That's a really good point. And I try and point out to the family members, it's normally the family members aren't ready to let their loved one go. Yeah. And so I'll say, I understand that you want them to be around, but when you look at it from their perspective, what are they staying around for? And they'll say for me, and I'll say, but you have your life, you're busy. Have you told your loved one that it's okay for them to go? Please, you know, know that we love you. Come visit us in spirit if you if that's a thing, if you can really do it, but it's okay for you to go. And is that something that you see a lot that you 
that you can counsel your family members on when they have a loved one who's dying or do you not go there through hospice? You know, it just depends. Um, I feel like I would love to go there more and I do at times, but hospice is also made up of a social worker and a chaplain. Right. And I think the families sometimes will look, which is great, which is great and normal for them to look towards the social worker and the chaplain visits for for conversations like that. Every once in a while, I still will talk to the families or questions will come up or I think because I really like educating and I like talking about this stuff, I'll try to bring it up a little more with the family. So, um, yes. And there are other members of the hospice team that I think get those questions a little, a little more, but they definitely do come up. And the whole, the whole point of what I want people to know is that there's a hospice team available to you. Um, Side note, even when your loved one dies on hospice, you still have a whole year of bereavement services at your service. If you, if your family needs it. Um, What does that entail? What does that include? It depends on the hospice company. So there's a bereavement a coordinator who usually can offer either personal support or support groups or just depending on like what the agency offers, but it could be one-on-one services. It can be group support. It can just be a phone call here and there. Um, and people don't really utilize it because they don't know. Support as in counseling, you mean like see yeah. a counselor yeah. who can help with grieving and all of that. Yeah. I yeah. love grief support groups. I know like they are really people do not want to do it. I get it. I'm kind of resistant to it too. But now that I, uh, I just think healing and you know community care can really be helpful. I think. I think a lot of times we live in isolation, especially when we're grieving and having when we're feeling bad. It's like we don't want to tell other people. And I think that's what the main thing we need to do is connect to other people when you're feeling like that, especially other people who understand. Well, and other people who are going through the same thing, thing, even though you think, well, how how could they know how I'm feeling? And then you hear them say something and it's like, whoa, that's like I said it myself. Yeah. 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 Good point. Yeah. What led you to become a hospice nurse? Did you grow up in a family of undertakers? (laughs) No. (laughs) Um, Far from it. So I was, uh, I was, I finished nursing school and I wanted to work in the ICU, which is the intensive care unit. And then I thought I'd go on to further schooling and work at anesthesia or maybe get my nurse, become a nurse practitioner. Um, But after a couple of years in the ICU, I really learned a lot. And I really learned that this is not what I wanted to do. Um, I thought I made the wrong choice altogether. I wasn't sure if I wanted to be in nursing anymore because I really just didn't like the fast pace of it all. I, I felt like I had to hurry up and care about really serious things like death and dying and trying to keep someone alive. And, but I had to like hurry because it was really fast paced. Even if you only had two patients in the ICU, you normally only have two patients, but they're so critically ill. It's very task oriented and really like trying to keep them alive. It can be really stressful for everybody. And after a while, I was like, there has to be a better way. Like, we need to be, I just saw, a, we are missing the mark in healthcare and it's no one's fault. It's just the way our society has been built, I think, where we're not really looking at the big picture for a lot of people. And I felt like people were dying in a way they didn't need to die. Like they were going to die no matter what. And I feel like I, if we would have said that a little sooner, they would have been able to go home and die with their family at home versus in the hospital, hooked to a bunch of machines and having to finally make the decision to turn them all off. So just multiple situations like that made me be like, there has to be a better way to do this. Like, what else can I be doing? Where else can I go that there will be a better way to die? Um, so hospice became my next step. And I just sort of jumped, you know, I, I just sort of was like, I guess I'll try it. We'll see. I wasn't really happy where I was. So I um, applied for a job that said you needed hospice experience, which I didn't have, but they luckily hired me. And then I, that's where I got my start. That was probably seven years ago or so. Well, I live it. I live in the deep South. So down here, they would say, darling, you were being led yeah. to do that. You were being led. I was led to do this work too, from the <laughs> spiritual side, because, you know, I see dead people. I see spirits in my mind's eye 
And this mm-hmm. dead Pope showed up one time, Julie, whole Pope hat, whole nine yards. And I said, well, who are you? And he said, I'm Clement. And I said, I never heard of a Pope Clement. And he goes, yeah, I was number six. I said, great. How can I help you? <laughs> kind of like, why are you here? And he mm-hmm. said, you're supposed to teach the world what happens when somebody dies. And I said, uh, I'm not doing that. I'm a businesswoman. People will think I'm nuts. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just get on with it. So I looked him up. Turns out he was in office during the Black Plague when Mm -hmm. most of two thirds of Europe died. And he's best known for his prayers for the dying and his prayers for the dead. And I thought, okay, I can't make that stuff up. Number one. And number two, he said, it's been so bastardized and people are so afraid. And so that's when that's how I got on this journey and started talking about what happens as somebody's dying in the 12 phases of transition. And the first time I saw that stuff was when my own mother was dying and she was in an in inpatient hospice facility. I got a call. We were, we got on a plane. We were there. We didn't get on a plane. We drove and my husband flew up and we were there. Uh, it was like a nine hour drive between where I live in Birmingham and where she was in Columbus, Ohio. And the nurses said, she's just come in from the hospital. She's going to be around for a couple of weeks. You know, it may be, it may be a while, blah, 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 blah. I start seeing all these different phases of transition. It was the first time I was seeing it, but I knew intuitively she's not going to be around two weeks. So this is a Saturday. Everybody goes home. I stay at the facility with her in her room and I'm watching all this stuff happen. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be surprised if she makes it through the night. And the nurses kept saying, no, no, she's, she's hydrated. She's going to be here a long time. She died at five o'clock the next morning. Wow. I talk about it in my book. So I, I could, I knew what was going on and I kind of felt like a schizo during that time because here I am grieving the loss of my mother and I'm watching all this spiritual stuff happen. And then within a couple of years, Pope Clement showed up and because by that time I'd worked with many families. And I could give them that information and communicate with their loved one, even if they couldn't communicate. And he's like, you got to teach the world how to do this stuff. Everybody can do it. You just got to teach them how to do it. So that's how my, all my stuff came about. Why is there, why is there such a disconnect with dying in our current society? I, I think it's been probably over the last 75 years or so, my grandfather, My Mima's husband was a detective in the Columbus, Ohio police department was killed in the light line of duty in 1938 when my mom was 12 and they, they waked him in my great grandmother's living room, which is what most families used to do. So why do you think there's such a disconnect over the last 75 years? Cause it wasn't that way since the beginning of time. Right. I think it was probably, I'm sure it was slow, right? Like, I think it was like, we, we really um, like the healthcare system developed, right? In a good way, probably. And, and there were some great things about it. And then slowly, but surely it started taking away people when they were sick and taking away people when they were dying. And, and then the funeral industry, again, like not that I, I don't want to act like I'm talking bad about these two industries, but I think then they started getting involved where they take the body, they do different things to the body. Here's a funeral home to have the body in. Versus, like you said, it being in the home and more of a um, hands-on process with the family. Like, I think back to the movie um, Braveheart, where this little boy sees his dad and brother who just died in battle. And, like, the the village people were, like, cleaning up the bodies. And they weren't, like, hushing the kids away to not see the dead bodies that died in battle. And I know it's a movie, so that is what it is. But I think to myself, that's what it needs to be like, you know, dying should not be this thing that no one discusses or sees or don't show the kids or the kids don't go to the funeral. Um, And I think that's just slowly but surely over the years, that's just started happening. And I, and I think there's, we're trying to change it. I mean, I don't know if I'm maybe speaking into a vacuum because like everyone I follow on social media is also doing what I'm doing. So it seems like we're changing, but I hope we are because 
Um, I think that's what's creating all the fear is that we no longer see it or talk about it or uh, it's turned into this like taboo topic, which is it's not taboo. It just seems like it is because we never talk about it. We don't see it. We don't um, we don't show it. Right. It's like all my videos where I show like real people dying um, all get censored saying uh, saying it's uh, like inappropriate or or too sensitive, which I think is really I. it's like, why? Why? Why is this too sensitive? This is a, the most natural thing in life. Um, you, bring, you bring up a really good point about the funeral thing. I haven't thought about this for a long time, but five, maybe six generations of my family in Ohio have all been buried out of the same funeral home with the same undertakers and our funeral directors, I guess they're called now. And when we were little, we used to go to the wakes, to the visitation hours. And my, I remember my parents saying that there's nothing, you know, you need to know that this is part of life. This is a normal thing. I can remember being a three and four year old and I'd get with my siblings and all my cousins. And this was this really old funeral home that's still in downtown Columbus called Egan Ryan. And they have this stairway where they have all the caskets, like the showroom for the caskets upstairs. Yeah. We used to go play up there as little kids where all the grownups were down, you know, all crying and doing whatever they were doing and talking. And um, gosh, you just triggered a memory for me on You're that. But, are great. They're taking you around. That's good. My my parents and all of my uh, relatives, uh, there were a gaggle of little kids there. And we had a ball because we were out of the way and we'd play hide and seek among the caskets and stuff, which sounds really morbid now. But gosh, I haven't thought of that in a long time. Well, I don't I don't expect there to be wakes in homes. I don't think that there's, there's going to be visitation hours with the body there very often in a home. Jackie Kennedy, by the way, was waked in her own apartment on Fifth Avenue. She died, what, maybe like 20 that. some years ago. Yeah. But do most people, do you find that most people prefer to die at home? And if so, how do we get the family and even society in general away from the Ugh, the thought of that gives me the creeps factor. What what do you find? Do most people want to want to pass at home? And how do we get that so that that's more common? I think most people want to die at home, but they don't know what it what that entails, right? Well, most so here's the thing. I think it's just going to take time and exposure for this to change because right now people don't even talk about where they'd want to die for the yeah. most part, right? So. But I think if you are faced with that, which everyone will be, uh, if you're going to die, um, if you're dying from some kind of disease, um, I would say most people would say they'd want to die at home. Uh, and the reason why it's not really, we don't really know is because most people don't talk about it. So I think this is the whole point of me existing, you existing to try to bring this topic back up in the world and say, hey, there's a reason why we should talk about this and know what we want and need. I also think if more people want to die at home, in their home, which I think most people do. We don't do a very good job as a society um, to help with that. Hospice is great. Uh, however, there's a huge missing link in hospice that I think we need to address, which isn't necessarily being addressed right now, which is the family has to care for their dying loved one. If you're gonna be at home on hospice, at home, not in a hospice house or in a nursing home somewhere, in the home, the family does, I would say, 85% of the work. So like there is not a nurse there all the time, not even close. So the, the, the family is giving the medications, changing the person, um, caring for the person, basically doing all of the work. Um, and they're going to be there most of the time while the patient's dying. The, the nurse, it's not like, oh, they start getting closer to death and then the nurse is there all the time. The nurse is never there all the time. So that's a lot to ask of a family. I mean, physically, emotionally, um, even just to work, most people work, you know, so there's a missing link there where, where I really feel like as a society, if we want to start um, moving this into the home, which I think we should, we need to provide more support, I think, uh, especially hospice, if we can somehow provide some kind of home health care uh, that that's really, really needed. Because a lot of people are like, how do people do this? I have to work. I have children. I have, 
a whole life I need to care for and try to care for my dying loved one. It's really hard. Is that where private duty nurses for those that can afford it come into play? And also does a death doula act kind of like a private duty nurse where the family usually pays for a death doula? Because I don't think hospice covers that. Do they? No, hospice, no. So um, it's all, it would be private pay for like the daily care needs. And then death doulas, depending on the death doula, some death doulas do things like change the patient, give medications, and some death doulas don't. So it, so it just depends. But therein lies the, you know, that only benefits people who have the money to do that, right. which is majority, majority of people do not, you know, even the middle, even middle-class America doesn't have an extra, you know, thousand to two thousand dollars laying around a month to pay for that and that's not i mean that's that's like lowballing it right? right so i think it's a huge i mean i could talk and talk and talk about that forever because it's a huge disservice we do uh, basically you have to have money to die comfortably at home i think or mm-hmm. family that can provide the care which is really hard mm-hmm yeah good point mm-hmm. back to dr kerr up in buffalo he says uh, medical end of life care is an assembly line of the absurd, <laughs> meaning, you know, somebody's dying or somebody's dying. Why are you going to do all these tests and run all these procedures and do surgeries and things like that? And so, my question to you along those lines is how does a family know when it's time to call in hospice or when it's time to stop? the craziness, even if the doctors don't agree? Oh, gosh, that's hard. Um, It's really hard to, I could speak to that generally. I would say generally, if you know you have some kind of terminal illness, meaning like you're not sure exactly when you're going to die, but most people know that if you have a glioblastoma, right, just to give an example, you're going to die from that, like most likely. So if you know that, and then you have uh, hopefully... So see me, so for me, I feel like it starts in healthcare. Like it really makes me upset knowing that we have doctors that like don't talk about end of life, right? Or like don't, you know, they, they, I have my, I have doctors, real MDs on my TikTok page that like argue with me about how awful hospice is. It's mind blowing. I, I think that's the minority, but still, you know, that like people don't understand that like um, end of life is a part of life including people in medical. So I think it starts there. I think our medical schools need to have a whole end of life uh, uh, year of, I think every doctor should be like in at least like one year of palliative care, you know, to learn about end of life and how to talk about it and how to bring it up. But if your doctor isn't doing that and you know, you've been um, experiencing any kind of chronic illness or an illness that you know will eventually be terminal. um, If you're, sleeping, you know, 16 to 18 hours a day, if you can't eat, if you're in the hospital more than you're not in the hospital. I mean, to me, those are signs that maybe hospice is, is the place for you. And, um, I would always say, bring it up, bring it up to your doctors. If you're even thinking about it, right. If you're even that good to be thinking about it, because most people aren't, because they don't want to think about it. But if you are bring it up to your doctors. And then if they still um, are not wanting to talk to you about it or say they don't know or say, no, it's not time, but you're still questioning it, you don't even need a doctor's referral to go on to hospice. So you could always just check it out. You could call a hospice company and let them know what's going on and see if um, someone can come out. And I always say, when in doubt, check it out. You don't have to do it. You don't have to sign on to hospice just because you met with a hospice liaison. You can just listen to what they have to offer, see if it sounds like what you want. Um, But in general, it shouldn't be up to the patient and their families to figure out if they need to be on hospice or not. You know, I mean, that's their, ultimately their decision. Yes. But our healthcare system needs to be able to talk to people about this. Um, Yeah, that's my soapbox. No, it was good. Good. Well said. I experienced this with my younger sister, Joan, Mm. who had an AVM, Mm -hmm. which is arterial venal malformation, right? Is that what you call it? And it blew. She collapsed in a store. 
she mm-hmm. uh, she vomited, she aspirated in the restroom of a store. Some good Samaritan found her after at least 20 minutes without oxygen. Wow. She shows up at the emergency room. She's on a ventilator, all of that. Never, never recovered. So three days into this, I'm on a plane in a couple hours. I'm back in Columbus. I show up. I can communicate with her telepathically. Wow. I She's in phase 11 of 12. She's ready to go. And all the doctors are saying, it's early. You know, we need to see what's going on. And it's early. And the family's all going, it's early. You know, we have hope. Everybody's praying all that. Well, after three days of that, and I spend the nights with my loved ones, the family's there during the day. I'm there for part of the day, but I spend the night. I know my way around a hospital. You know, I worked with surgeons. I was on the, that's the top of the food chain and the doctor pecking order. I know I'm not intimidated by it. So one night, the third night, I asked the nurse in the ICU, I said, can you ask the doctor to come up? This is like two in the morning. I knew it was a resident because all the residents are on all night long. Mm -hmm. So he comes up and I said, look, you know, and I know she's not going to get out of this. If she does, she's not going to want to be alive. Mm -hmm. And he said, I agree. And I said, please get your colleagues to talk to my family because you guys are giving them false hope and it's Mm -hmm. not fair. And so he did, God bless him. I think because he was young enough that he hadn't been inundated by all the you know, I'm afraid to talk about it thing. And he did. And we took her off the vent the next day and she passed peacefully with all of us there with her. But it took me having the golden ovary courage to contact this doctor and say, look, you guys got to quit telling the family this stuff because it's given them false hope. When somebody finds themselves in that position, in my opinion, having gone through it more than once, I believe follow your gut on that. We know as family members, okay, this isn't looking good, regardless of what the doctors are saying. I don't have a good feeling about this. And just sit them down and really confront them and say, if it was your sister, if it was your mom, if it was your whoever, what would you do? You know, Mm -hmm. and they, they're human. They're being, they're trying to save the person, but it comes to a point where you think, okay, this is not going to happen. And so we need to just move on with that. Would you suggest that people contact a certain department in the hospital? Is there like a, I don't know, in a, is there like a palliative care um, department or a hospice department where there's a, I know some big center uh, medical centers will have a physician that heads that department that can come in and talk to the family and then be the liaison with the medical staff that's caring for that patient. I think, I mean, from my experience in the ICU, which is, uh, I had many, I had similar experiences. Like, I mean, it wasn't my sister. It was patients of mine where I felt like I had to be the advocate, the one person to be like, can we have a family meeting (laughs) about what's really happening here? Because we just keep talking about the patient's creatinine numbers, you know, and like the family's focusing on the kidneys getting better. And like, when we, we all know what the big picture is, this person's not going to get better. Why are we not talking about this? So I'd say in general, um, I would say in general, you could either say to the the doctor who's caring for your loved one or like the team of people that you want to have a family meeting with a social worker, because social workers are great at really trying to like get the whole group of people together, the team together with the family so they can talk openly. And I think usually, I could be wrong, but I think a lot of times Doctors just need to hear that the family is open to even talking about it. So the family talks about it first, Mm -hmm. you know, um, we can see that this is not going well, or or we know our loved one. And if if they're going to live um, not an independent lifestyle where they can fully be as they were before, um, they would not want to be alive. So what's the likelihood of this happening? Right. So I think even the family members being, open to the doctors and saying, hey, we are willing to have these open discussions about what's really happening, can get the doctors uh, to under to, to start talking about it. 
but there's not an easy answer. That's why I feel like I took to social media because <laughs> they're not an easy answer. Yeah. All you under, you know, that like there's teaching, there's teaching hospitals, which have a huge team of people kind of readily available to talk to you. Then there's smaller hospitals that aren't always like that. And each hospital has different people to talk to for different things. So it's hard. It is hard to navigate our medical system. And I think you and I are been involved in it. So we understand it a little more, but if you don't, it's really difficult. Um, so in, I think speaking generally, just be an advocate and speak your mind and your thoughts and, and, and ask your questions. And um, if you're not getting answers, go to somebody else, right? And keep, keep, um, just keep advocating for yourself or for your loved one. I think your idea about calling in a social worker is brilliant. Yeah. I hadn't heard that before and I hadn't thought of it, but I think that makes tons of sense. I guess I didn't realize that they could serve that role. The only, my inter, only interaction with social workers is how do we get the home care equipment to the house before we bring whomever home? So that's really good to know that they have that capability. Yeah. Being, they can, be, they can get that meeting going. Yeah. They can get yeah. that meeting going. That's, that's a great suggestion. And they can, they can even like navigate the meeting. They're great at, you know, getting the conversation going, getting the different doctors all together. So. Mm -hmm. Person, nurse and hospice pioneer, Barbara Carnes, who I know Love is her. your colleague. I've had her on the show too. She says the body knows how to be born and how to die. Do you agree? Yes. I feel like I, 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 I always, um, uh, I always, take it like the things she says are so fascinating. The body is, the body is built to survive birth and it's built to die. Um, and I see that with my own eyes every day, that first year of hospice nursing was mind blowing to me seeing, seeing how, you know, I went from ICU nursing where we did so many things to try to keep the body alive. And I saw how a lot of the times that made things, uh, not maybe not worse, but there was just this vicious cycle that we had to keep doing to try to keep this person alive and then to see us doing basically nothing and the body brilliantly died peacefully without us having to do much um and to see that over and over and over and over again is what made me be like wow this is a this is amazing we are built to do this and yes it's sad people think it's amazing they're still dying but it's amazing to see how our bodies literally will take care of us um, and you do a great job on your social media channels about educating people in here's what to expect the, the breathing, you talk about the rally, you talk about all those specifics and you do such a great job of educating people. When my mother was dying, I was the only one with her. There were a couple of nurses in the room, hospice nurses at this inpatient facility. I had called the family. I said to her, Everybody's on the way. If you can hold on, fine. If you can't, that's fine. I'm here with you. And she was doing that eyes wide open, that chain breathing. And, and now I look at that, Julie, and I think my family members would have been mortified had they been there. They, that would have haunted them for the rest of their lives. Whereas I hadn't witnessed it before, but I could see what was happening from a, a, a spiritual perspective. I could see the angels in the room. I could see the deceased loved ones. I could see what was happening to her spirit as it was exiting her body. So I was able to deal with it because I had the spiritual side of the equation. She knew I could see it. Her spirit knew that. And I, to this day, she died in 2002, to this day, I believe, the rest of the family members weren't there because they all got there within 10 minutes of her going. She didn't want them to see that. And here's the thing with that. Can I add really quick? So I think because um, that's the thing that I want people to understand. I feel like not everyone needs to see that. Right. And not everyone can like, like my sister, for example, is like, I don't know if I can handle that, like seeing that. Right. But I also think our and I think that is true. And I think if people could know and see it prior, right, kind of I'm not, uh, you know, uh, to understand that, see this breathing, 
right here before it's their loved one, right? See this breathing that I'm showing you? This is a normal part of dying. Like, I think because they don't know it's normal, they don't know that the eyes being open and them looking different and, and it can look a little scary because your loved one doesn't look like themselves. Their coloring's different, their eyes are open, they're breathing funny. It's so hard not to take that image and make it into something bad, right? And to make it into like, they're suffering. This is weird. Why does they look like this can't be right? And what I want to do is show people enough that they know that if they, uh, if they can't see what you're seeing, right? Like you are okay because you are seeing the spiritual side of it. But if they can't see that, to still know that their loved one is okay and that that's a normal part, expected part of death and dying and that they're okay. Um, that is like the whole purpose of my channel is to be able to expose people to it just a little bit so they're not so shocked. Well, I the only place I'd ever seen it before was in a movie when somebody yeah, was being strangled or something. And I was I, like, oh my God, you know, and, the, and yeah, I think that's yeah. how, that's where most people have seen it. And so that just, pi let's pile on to the fear. Oh my God. The only place I've seen it has been in a murder scene or something oh, in a right. movie. Or like a movie where the person's saying like, they're talking right before they die and they just close their eyes and die. And you're like, oh, that's not how this is going. That's not how this goes. Usually every once in a while, someone will do that, but it's usually yeah. not how it looks. Yeah. Well, and, and I, it, it was not pleasant for me to see that, right. but I had the other side of the equation that, that balanced it a little for me, but it, yeah, to this day, it's not something I would choose to go watch. Mm -hmm. But knowing that it's part of the natural dying process really helps. So God bless you for the educating that you're doing. Are you amazed at how interested people are in discussing this? It's kind of like it's, you know, been kept in the closet or something and people are, are, if you, if we ask people that follow you and follow your channel, just regular people that aren't involved in medical or after afterlife or whatever, if you said, well, you know, do you really enjoy and do you really benefit from watching this channel on death and dying? They probably wouldn't even admit it. It's like, <laughs> I don't, you know, it's kind of in the closet a little bit. Are, are you amazed at how many yes. people are interested in this? Yes. I'm very validated. It's very validating because I, you know, in my everyday life before this whole social media thing started, I was, my, my, my job was not a topic of conversation. Like if I, if people knew I was a hospice nurse, but people really weren't wanting to talk to me about it. They'd always just go like, Oh God, or oh, that must be depressing or, Oh, you angel, you know? And so it was almost like uncomfortable to talk about it because people's reactions were always so obviously like, yeah, no, uh, until they had a loved one dying. Right. And, and then they would want to talk to me about it. And then I would say all these things and they'd be like, Oh my God, I can't believe this. Why don't people know this? And that is what made me think, I'm going to start a channel and I'm just going to start talking about it and see what happens. And so the fact that people on the internet seem to be able to handle it more or like maybe because it's removed, you know, it's really, it's really validating because in my everyday life, not so much. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and that's what I find. I'm, I'm a guest a lot on a lot of podcasts and a lot of shows. And I talk about the 12 phases of transition and all that. The responses we get are mind boggling of people saying, oh my God, that happened with my mom. She could see her deceased Aunt Clara or whomever. And, and what you say brings so much comfort to us because we just thought we were imagining it or that she was hallucinating or something like that. So I understand what you're talking about with that. A couple more questions before we wrap up. You've been really vocal, really public about that you're a recovering alcoholic mm -hmm. and I am a recovering sugar addict. I had my four year sugar sober date this just this past weekend. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. So, and I believe, thank you. I believe alcoholism is a sugar addiction. I'm convinced of that. It's like, let's just do a sugar IV here. You don't even have to digest it. So I'm with you on the addiction thing. 
Do you think, because I know that there are a lot of recovering addicts that are in end of life care. And it's almost like, do you think that there's some type of a different perspective that we recovering addicts have perhaps that allows us to deal with that and to help people, help comfort people and help people through that portion of their lives and and their loved ones who are left behind? It's a great question. It's a great question. I know they, now that I am sober and in a 12-step program, which I only say because uh, it's a huge part of like my life, right? And that feeds into my work and vice versa. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I know personally now that I'm in it, now that I'm in recovery and I've, and I've, and I've been in recovery almost as long as I've been a hospice nurse. I think I was a hospice nurse, not in recovery for maybe six months or so. Um, but you know, my life is a life of service in general. Like that is how I help myself. That's my, that helps my well being. um, just in general. So I think healthcare is also like that, right? So they kind of feed together. I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if I would directly correlate it to my life. It wasn't like I was thinking it, if it happened, it happened unconsciously, but I know it definitely, uh, my, my work. My work as a nurse definitely serves me um, and my alcoholism because uh, it helps me be of service to other people. It's a place, a place where I can be of service and being of service really helps me get out of my own head and get out of my own way. Um, So, yeah, but I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. Great way to put that, you know, a life of service. I do the same thing just in a different way, but I think the end of life care is, really a ramp up. It's ramped up from being an ICU nurse even, or being a labor and delivery nurse or whatever, an OR nurse, something along those lines. And I never thought about it before, but when I was preparing these questions for our chat today, that came into my head and I thought, okay, I'm going to ask it and see, see what comes up with that. I just thought it was a a fascinating um, concept. Yeah. Tell yeah. us about the demystifying death and dying retreat you and Nurse Penny Smith are doing in the Nurse fall. Penny. Oh Nurse my gosh. Penny. Nurse Penny and I, first off, Hospice Nurse Penny and Hospice Nurse Julie, <laughs> we met on TikTok. We met on social media, if you can believe it. And we are just the best of friends now. And yeah, we are um, doing a retreat in Boone, North Carolina which I've never been in the art of living. I think it's called the art of living institution. I could be wrong, but it's something like that art of living. It's a retreat center. And her and I in September are doing a retreat and it's just going to be a weekend retreat of. It's so funny, right? I was going to say a weekend retreat of death and dying, which sounds like, why would you ever do that? (laughs) But it's all about education and talking about your why. Like, that's what we want to do. We want to bring people in and know that why they're there. Why are they there? What's their purpose of being there? And how can we help support that and be in community together to um, talk about and prepare for end of life? And I think a lot of people associate that with like sadness or fear or discomfort. And I think nurse Penny and I really just want to flip the script and show people that you can do that and still have fun and still be wildly connected to each other. And these types of conversations can really um, help develop your life. Like I really, really believe that preparing for death, not only helps you have a more peaceful and prepared death, but also also helps you have a more peaceful and prepared life. Life, life, life is about life. And I like, go hand in hand. Yeah, I agree. The the interesting thing about this too, and you already said it, when I saw that you guys were doing this, I thought, oh my God, and both of you are so much fun that yeah. you guys are gonna put a really interesting spin on discussing things that maybe are, are difficult topics. I don't think maybe that are difficult topics for most, most people. And at the same time, have a wonderful time together as well. 
And so good for you. When I saw that, I thought, good for those girls. That's just a wonderful thing. So we're going to put, we'll put all the links to that in the show notes uh, for today. So how can people get in touch with you? Well, I am at Hospice Nurse Julie, basically across all social media. So wherever you look on social media, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, um, Facebook, and I just launched a website, uh, hospicenursejulie.com. So if you don't feel like going to social media things, hospicenursejulie.com is a place where you can look up my videos or look up um, different references, frequently asked questions. You can sign up for a newsletter. Um, You can get a hold of me. You can email me. Uh, It just depends. But yeah, so those places. And I do have eventually, Julie, have a book coming out. It's just in the very, very beginning. So I have a book deal. I'm getting it all done. It should be published uh, summer 2024. So that's there is some time there, but that's in the works. Well, we'll so have you exciting. back. We'll yeah. have you back when that comes yeah. out. And anybody that's watching, if you want a copy of my book, Angelic Attendance, What Really Happens as We Transition from This Life into the Next, which is the spiritual side of the equation, if you want, we'll send you a free copy of it, digital and audiobook version. Just go to my website, askjulieryan.com, click on the Ask Julie button, just say, Hey, I heard you on the show with Hospice Nurse Julie. I'd love a copy of your book. We'll send you a free copy. And I hope that it helps you and your family as you do that. So as you go through this, I mean, everybody's going to go through this, right? Going to go through this. Yeah. We're all going to lose loved ones. We're all going to die. So I think it it helps to educate everybody on the physical side and on the spiritual side. And on the spiritual side, again, now it's been validated with university-based research. So again, I love it when the science catches up with woo-woo, which I think has been around a whole lot longer than the science. We know that since the beginning of time. So everybody, thanks for joining us this week. Sending you lots of love from Sweet Home, Alabama, and also from California, where Julie is. Thanks for joining us. See you soon. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Julie on Instagram and YouTube at Ask Julie Ryan and like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. To schedule an appointment or submit a question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com. This show is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical, psychological, financial, or legal advice. Please contact a licensed professional. The Ask Julie Ryan Show, Julie Ryan and all parties involved in producing, recording, and distributing it assume no responsibility for listeners' actions based on any information heard on this or any Ask Julie Ryan shows or podcasts.